you ever get the feeling that we may be heading for a disaster? Or is it just me? <laughs> just me? Oh, okay. Then never mind, we'll just end the service here. <laughs> no. Throughout history, we've seen disasters, haven't we? In the Bible, we've seen disasters over and over and over again. In our nation, we've seen disasters. I mean, we've seen wars. We've seen people die. We've seen natural catastrophes. We've seen man-made catastrophes. We see moral catastrophes happening right now all around us. And it's a disaster, isn't it? To see what our nation is becoming from what it used to be. And, and it's sad, but those people that are out there driving these agendas are celebrating. They're saying, we're making a change, not realizing that it's a disaster. And, it, and it's going against what God has ordained for not just our country, but for, for humanity. So I thought, let's look a little bit about heading for a disaster. If you got your Bibles... Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. Now, a lot of times, if you want to know what's going on in the world, we look to Israel, don't we? Because really, they're the barometer of where we are in, in, in God's timelines. You want to know what's going on prophetically? Look to Israel. You know, what are they doing? You know, throughout history, I mean, we've seen wicked nations rise and wicked nations fall. But it all seems to revolve around what the nation of Israel was doing. You know, when they were walking with God, they were basically, you know, in power. They were, they, they were the, the, the influence of the world. But when they weren't walking with God, wicked nations rose and basically came in. You know, you looked at Babylon, we've looked at Assyria, we've looked at Egypt, we've looked at all those, you know, that were the mighty powers in, in, in the Bible that rose up and they were ungodly nations. But God used those ungodly nations to, to chastise and punish his people. And when they would finally repent, God would relent and, and send a blessing back to them. So let's look at that just a little bit. Right now, we're going to talk about judgment on Jerusalem and Judah, okay? So in the beginning of Isaiah, God is warning the nation. And it says, we're going to start out here in, in verse 1. It says, See now, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support. All supplies of food and all supplies of water. The hero and warrior, the judge and prophet, the soothsayer and elder, the captain of fifty and man of rank, the counselor, skilled craftsman, and clever enchanter. I will make boys their officials. Mere children will govern them. People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The youth will rise up against the old, the base against the honorable. I don't know about you, but this kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Do we see any of this maybe happening in the world around us? You know, what, what are people honoring anymore? The new, the young, instead of, you know, here God says, I'm going to take away all those things that make a nation great. You know, the, 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 the military might, you know, the leaders. And that's really, you know, what he's saying is those people that lead a nation, whether it be, you know, the, 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 the commanders of the armies or, or the, 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 the spiritual leaders. And, and I think that's what we see going on in our nation right now. You know, who are we standing up as the leaders of this nation? You know, some of the appointees coming out of the administration, you have to wonder because they're not mighty men of God. They're, they're, they're less than that, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You know, 
He says, but I will make boys their officials. Mere children will govern them. People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise up against the old, the base against the honorable. This was what God had, had pronounced against the nation of Israel. And I think you and I, we can learn from that, can't we? Hopefully our nation will learn from this. Man against man, neighbor against neighbor. Isn't that what they're doing right now is pitting everybody against everybody else? Mm -hmm. Division? Hatred. Hatred, yeah. You know, everybody's your enemy. You know, they're out to get you. You know, uh, for, for, you know, a lot of people, it, it's, you know, toxic masculinity or, uh, you know, whites against coloreds and all these different things. They're dividing us. And it's no different than what God had pronounced against Israel. So you can pretty much say that this is what God is pronouncing against our nation. Why? Rejecting God. Rejecting God, right? Well, let's go on and look a little bit more. Verse 6 says, A man will seize one of his brothers at his father's home and say, You have a cloak. You be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. But in that day, he will cry out, I have no remedy. I have no food or clothing in my house. Do not make me the leader of the people. I mean, they're, they're grasping at straws here. It's like, oh, you've got a cloak. You're rich, you know. You know, you be our leader. You know, isn't that kind of what's going on in our nation right now? Look at, look at what they're choosing to try and be our leadership. Are they moral people? Mm -mm. Godly people? No. People that you can say, I want to follow that person because they're walking with God. Mm -hmm. you know, we've been looking at, I mean, as it was in the days of Noah, right? Noah, we were told that he was a righteous man and he walked with God. Mm -hmm. Boy, this nation sure could use one of them as a leader. Right. We don't have one. And they're grasping at straws. They're like, you can get elected. We'll, we'll elect you because you, you, you'll, you'll do great things, right? You'll do exactly what we tell you. Mm -hmm. said, I have no food, no clothing in my house. Do not make me the leader of the people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sad. I mean, trying to find a leader right now that you can endorse personally. You know, it, it's hard to say, yes, this person without a shadow of a doubt is somebody I know that God would approve of. Mm -hmm. It goes on to say, and again, this is God speaking about Jerusalem and Judah. It says, Jerusalem staggers. Judah is falling. Their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. I'm sure glad that our words and deeds aren't against the Lord. Oh, wait. We keep kicking God out of everything, don't we? His ways aren't right. His ways are evil. That's what they tell you. You know, right's wrong, wrong's right. I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that this is strangely similar to what we see going on in our world. You know? It says, Jerusalem staggers, Judah is falling, their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. When God has a presence in our nation, our nation did have a glory about it. That's right. Then we kicked him out of our government. Mm -hmm. We kicked him out of our courts. Mm -hmm. We kicked him out of our schools. And in a lot of cases, we've kicked him out of our homes. Even churches. Even churches, yeah. They, they, they call themselves a church, but it, it, it's not about God's glory. His son is his glory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, and they've kicked him out. Mm -hmm. And then we act shocked and amazed that things are as bad as they are right now. Mm -hmm. We were looking at it in Sunday school, Romans chapter 1. You ever want to know why things are the way they are? Start reading about what happened in Romans chapter 1. God turned them over to their hearts and their evil desires. It's a picture of the world around us right now. Yes. It goes on, verse 9. 
The look on their faces testify against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. They parade it like Sodom? Wow. We, we, we've read the stories. We've, we've talked about the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember, you know, the angels came down to rescue Lot. They were going to see if it was really as bad as what God had heard, is the way the story goes. So God himself had sent two angels into the, to the city, and, and the city basically came together, and they were going to rape the angels. Mm -hmm. The men of the city were. Mm -hmm. and, and it says here that they parade their sins like Sodom. Is that happening in the world around us right now, that the, the mankind is parading their sins up and down the streets? Yeah. In, the, in the city centers or in our courts? Yes. Wow. Are we sure this wasn't written to America? <laughs> I don't know. It says, woe to them. Notice it says, they have brought disaster upon themselves. This nation has nobody to blame but itself of the disaster that this nation is becoming. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do we have to be afraid? No, Jesus. Jesus, yes. But, you know, uh, well, let's just continue on. Look at verse 10. It says, tell the righteous... It will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruits or the fruit of their deeds. God is giving the comfort to the righteous. See, throughout the Bible, we we have we've got done reading about Noah. We went through, and he was a man who was declared to be in right standing with God. He was righteous. And what did God do? He excuse me. He protected Noah. He told Noah, build an ark. And Noah had, had to go, what's an ark? <laughs> and, and line it with pitch inside and out. Mm -hmm. and, and we know the rest of the story. He said, Noah, go on, go on in and get into the boat. Mm -hmm. But the, do the door stayed open for seven days. The invitation was to the rest of the world to enter into God's safety. Nobody answered the call. Finally, God shut the door. Noah didn't shut the door. God, or Noah did not shut out the world from salvation. God shut the door in judgment of the rest of the world is what we find out. Mm -hmm. So for us, he says, tell the righteous it will be well with them. If you're in right standing with God, it will be well with us. Mm -hmm. You see all this stuff going on around us right now? God knows. But he also sees us. You know, for, for the nation of Israel, they were judged as a nation. Their leaders caused them to rise or fall. You remember they all wanted Saul as their king because he looked like a king? And he didn't do so well, did he? And he caused the nation to fall. David, he didn't look like a king, but yet his heart was one after God. And he caused the nation to flourish under God. One nation under God. So here we're told, tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Mm -hmm. Verse 11, woe to the wicked. Disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what they, their hands have done. Youths oppress my people, Women rule over them. Oh, my people, your guides lead you astray. They turn you from the path. God's desire was for the, 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 the elders and, and for, the, for the, the, the religious leaders to, to, to guide the nation, to rule the nation under God. But where were these men? Nowhere to be found. So it says that the youth 
guide the people. And it says women rule over them. And that's not putting women down. The question is, is where are the men? They're not where they're supposed to be. We could ask that about the nation that we live in right now. Where are the men? How many homes are single parent homes? Where are the men? You know, God says he, his heart goes out to the fatherless and the widows. In both of those cases, where are the men? Not doing what God appointed and anointed them to do. That's right. Oh, my people, your guides lead you astray. They turn you from the path. God is talking to the nation right now. He says, you're listening to the wrong people. They're leading you astray. Does that happen today? Are, 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 there, are, are, there, are there people out there leading people astray? Well, let's look at that just a little bit more, okay? Because, you know, this was Isaiah. And, and a lot of times in the Old Testament we go, well, that was way back when. Even though we can look at this and go, man, that's, that's a lot like what's going on right now. So let's jump into the New Covenant and see what it says here. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Starting out at verse 1. It says here, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. <laughs> that, that's a warning right there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We've seen that there was false teachers. What happened because of them? The nation declined. Mm -hmm. They started doing the things God told them not to do, and they were encouraged to do it. We're told that in Romans, the very end of, the, of, of chapter 1. Basically, we're told that you know, these wicked people, they encourage other people to join in too. Mm -hmm. And that, that, we see that happening today too. Right. It's pretty bad when you've got people that are you know, over their heads deep in sin and they're shocked at somebody else's sin anymore. They're like, dude, I can't believe they just did that. <laughs> But here we're given a, a warning. Then it says that also there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. There are teachers out there today in pulpits that deny Jesus Christ. Oh, it's all about the Holy Spirit. No, it's got to be, you know, it's just God the Father. Well, no, God gave us his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He is the yes. glory of God, yes, he manifest in human form. And it says, denying the sovereign one who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. You know, sometimes you look at these false teachers and you go, Lord, why don't you do something? But God always does. Mm-hmm. Why, why does he wait so long? He wants them to repent also. He's giving them every opportunity to turn from their wicked ways and to come back to God. But it seems like I, I watch and so many times they, they fall. Their sins find them out. The world goes, that ain't quite right. What are you doing? But we're warned that they're out there. This is bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful way and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Have any of these false teachers brought a bad name onto the church? Yes. Oh yeah, you hear it, don't you? Well, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, no, it's being led by hypocrites. And yeah, there are hypocrites out in the audience too. Listen, you know, how many of them all bless you, brother? And then when you get outside, they'll stab you in the back. 
rob you blind. Mm -hmm. hmm. And it says they will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Bring a bad name upon our Lord and Savior. How many people don't want anything to do with the church anymore because they got taken? Or, or they were being told bad things from the, the pulpit? Hey, the mothership's going to land. We've got to go out there and meet the, you know, because uh, the, uh, the celestial beings are coming down to get us. All sorts of weird things. No wonder the world looks funny at the church anymore. What's being taught? Definitely not the way anymore, is it? Not the word. Not the word. <laughs> That's what Paul told Timothy. Preach the word. Not a fantasy, not a story, and not what you think. Mm -hmm. Preach the word. Mm -hmm. It says in verse 3, In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. It's out there. You know, my best advice to you is let God handle it. But don't fall for it. It goes on to say now, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. Now, that word hell there is the word Tartarus. It's the only time it occur, occurs in the New Testament. And the way that the Greek uh, uh, presents it is basically, the, the, the thought is, is Tartarus is as far below hell as hell is below earth. It's the abyss. It's utter darkness. It's outer darkness. It's, it, it, I mean, it's unimaginable. And when those angels fell, that's where they were imprisoned. Mm -hmm. Their destruction was swift. There is no forgiveness for angels. It goes on to say, verse 5, If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on it, on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. The ungodly world. That's what God, you know, he looked down and he saw that the way of man had been corrupted and that there was violence and everything about man was ungodly. God says, I've got to do something. But, you know, in, in our view, God should do something about it right now, right? God said, Noah, you got to build an ark. And for a hundred years, Noah built the ark. God was patient. Why? Because he found Noah righteous. He was going to spare Noah because Noah was in right standing with him. And his family, too. You know, we just got done looking on Thursday night, you know, about Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You know, God saved Ham even though there was something that really bad happened through Ham. You can't say that he was a, a righteous person. But yet he was still saved because of Noah. God says, I'm going to take care of you and your family, Noah. You're going to be rescued. But it says that he was a preacher of righteousness. The world around him, they, they could never say it. We didn't know. For a hundred years, Noah preached righteousness. And how many came to salvation? Just his family. There's a lot of preachers out there that are getting discouraged because nobody's coming. How would you like to preach for a hundred years and have nobody come forward or, or to accept the message? Mm -hmm. You think Noah got discouraged? I think every now and then maybe he kind of like, Lord, what's going on? But he, we're told, you know, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, he's in the halls of faith because it says he believed God. He was commended for his faith. Mm -hmm. And it was by his faith that the world around him was condemned. Because God still had a promise to keep. He, he told Eve that her seed was going to crush the head of the serpent. Mm -hmm. 
And by Noah building the ark, the rest of the world suffered because of their ungodliness. It continues on. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Yeah, you know, we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, you remember when the, the, the Lord and two angels appeared to, to Abraham and he basically said, hey, wait right here, I want to get you something to eat. And he, he ran off and, and killed the calf and, and he had Sarai build, uh, make some bread for him and, and, and they sat down and they ate and then afterwards, you know, the Lord uh, asked the angels, should I reveal to Abram what's going to happen? And they did. And Abram started into that discourse of, Lord, far be it from you to destroy the righteous. If you find 50 righteous, will you spare the city? And we know that he got into the negotiation, right, with the Lord. How about 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, give me 35, 40, 30. And he got it all the way down to 10. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says, for 10 righteous, I will spare Sodom and Gomorrah. We know the story, right? Mm -hmm. Could he find 10? No. How many righteous were there? There was a lot. And again, and his family. See, we don't have the, the story, but what if, what if Abraham would have said, what if you find one righteous? God did find one righteous. And the two angels said, Lot, we need you out of the city now because we cannot do what we've been sent to do while you were still here. Mm -hmm. One righteous prevented God's wrath from being poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. That gives me great hope. Because God is not going to destroy this world again until his righteous people are taken out. And it says, For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Can anybody else relate to that right now? Do we see lawless deeds being enacted out around us right now? Yes, do. Does it torment you? Does it make you go, Lord, why? Where are you? Well, just like Lot, he's saying, I got to get you out of there before I do anything. Sure. Is it time? I don't know. We were kind of talking about that in Sunday school. When will this happen? I don't know. But the, the pronunciation was against the ungodly acts of man. What's going on around us right now but ungodliness, lawlessness. wickedness, lawlessness. All those things we've seen in Romans chapter 1. God turning them over to their heart's desires. <laughs> it's everywhere. Verse 9 says, If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. The idea there is basically to, to hold the unrighteous for punishment until the day of judgment happens. God knows who the righteous are. God knows who the unrighteous are. Remember back there in Isaiah, there was an encouragement to the righteous? If, we're, if we have Jesus Christ in our hearts, then we are in right standing with God because our sins have been atoned for. The debt has been paid. But yet we see all these things happening. But there's an encouragement there. Noah was saved from God's wrath. Lot and his family was saved from God's wrath until, Sarah, until his wife, remember the story? You know, they were escaping and she turned around and looked behind her, looking back at Sodom and Gomorrah. 
and she was turned into a pillar of salt. So what a strange part of the story. But yet, it showed you that her heart's desire was that ungodliness and that wickedness that was going on there. Maybe she said, I can't do without the malls or Walmart or all those things. I, I can't live without those things. We're running at, you know, running away from all those things. I had all the money. You know, we had money because Lot was rich. And he had to leave all that behind him. And she was turned to that pillar of salt. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't want that. But he, you know, so, so, you know, what's in this for us? What's, the, what's our part of the story? Well, look back at 1 Peter chapter 1. Because Peter had started out this passage, this epistle, with, with encouragement for the church. See, this was chapter 2 we just looked at. But we need to back up and look at what he was saying in chapter 1. So we'll start out at verse 1. Because it's hard to back up, you know, you just keep, wanting, I got to get a little bit more, a little bit more, so you keep backing up and you find yourself in verse 1. And it says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. It's the knowledge of God. See, what was happening in the days of Noah? It says they didn't know what was going to happen. They had no clue. They were not listening to God. They had, their, their desire wasn't on God. They were being, you know, it says they were marrying and beginning in marriage. They were eating and drinking, having a good time. All the time, God had been warning them. Noah had been preaching. Destruction is coming. For us, it's through the knowledge of, of our God and of Jesus Christ that we can have that peace with God. Even though we see all this happening, we've got peace. Because we know God's promise to us. Just like Noah, just like Lot, we are going to be rescued from this. That's our hope. Jesus is our hope. It's not that the world's going to get their act together. It's not that we're going to elect a leader that's going to save us. Our hope is in God and in his, his Son. It goes on to say, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. It says there that we have everything that we need to live a godly life. Well, what was the condemnation that happened for Sodom and Gomorrah and, and the world of Noah's time? But it was their ungodliness. If we don't want to see that kind of judgment pronounced upon us, we need to get godly. And how do we get godly? But we know God. And we have everything we need to know in the knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. It says, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Is this world around us corrupted? Mm -hmm. What was happening in the days of Noah, but the world was corrupted? What was happening in the, the city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah, but they were corrupted? Mm -hmm. We can escape that corruption here because of his promises to us. And we get to participate in the divine nature. Now, that's one of those things that, you know, what does that mean? Well, in my Bible, it has a reference to being Christ-like. You know, we're, we're told in Romans that we've been predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. 
That's participating in that divine nature. Well, I'm a sinner. Yes, God knows that. You've been forgiven. You've been cleansed. Now he asks us to, to look like his son and to shine that light of love into a dark place. And escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. How can we cause the darkness to flee? Have you ever been in a dark room? I mean a really dark room. Where no light is on whatsoever. How can you make the darkness flee? Turn on a light. How big a light does it need to be to cause the darkness to flee? Man, we got these little night lights around the house because I don't know about you, I hate kicking my toes on things in the dark. <laughs> and those little light bulbs aren't very big. We've got one in our bathroom. I mean, it's a little LED thing. And when it's really dark and that thing's on, you can see everything. Now, it may not be very bright. You can't read the newspaper by it, but you can see where you're going. For us, it's the same thing. If you want to see the darkness flee, Turn on a light. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why I think the enemy is attacking so many churches around this right nation right now is he can extinguish the light. Mm -hmm. If he can extinguish the light, the darkness creeps in. Mm -hmm. It's not about the, the numbers. It's about the presence of God. Mm -hmm. You and I get to, divide, to participate in that divine nature. We don't have to fear the coming judgment. We don't have to worry about what, what, what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. We have God's promises to us. Mm -hmm. And those promises are there for the rest of the world too. They can leave the darkness and join the light if they would just turn away from their wickedness mm -hmm. and repent. That's why God waited so long for, for the nation of Israel. His desire was that they would repent. That was why he waited so long in sending the flood in Noah's time. His desire was that they would repent. And right now, God is delaying judgment on this world around us because his desire is it's that they repent. We have a story to tell. The world right now thinks they're going down the right path. We're enlightened. We know better. We're, we're, I mean, things are great. No. You're falling into the wickedness. Evil men are out there leading you astray. Mm -hmm. See, the, 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 the enemy comes but to kill, steal, and destroy, mm -hmm. we're told. He would love nothing more than to take all of humanity down with him because he knows where he's going. Mm -hmm. His judgment has already been pronounced. And he's just waiting for the sentence to be carried out. And in the meantime, he's taking as many as he can with him. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Mm -hmm. That's his desire. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time that we can spend with you. And Lord, thank you for your promises to us. Even though, Lord, we see so much wickedness around us, we know that we are in right standing with you because of your Son. And we don't have to fear what's coming. We have your divine promises applied to us, Lord, that we are, we've been forgiven. And, Lord, that we won't suffer your, your wrath. Lord, help us to shine our light where you have placed us, Lord. To not allow the darkness to creep into where we are, but to continue to stand for you, to be steadfast and immovable. This is our prayer. We ask for your blessings in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Thank you.